Mark Bretscher studied chemistry at the University of Cambridge before joining the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in September 1961 as a research student with Sidney Brenner. After a postdoc in Stanford with Paul Berg, Mark came back to the LMB in 1965 for the rest of his scientific career, heading up the cell biology division between 1985 and 1994. His later work on membrane proteins, endocytosis and the mechanism of cell locomotion led to him being elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1985. He retired in 2005 and was an emeritus scientist at the LMB until 2013. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to Mark about his time at the LMB as a PhD student. 60 years ago, when Mark started, the genetic code was still unsolved. Messenger RNA had just been discovered and it was clear that it must be read three nucleotides at a time in a triplet code in order to specify the 20 possible amino acids from which proteins are made. But beyond that, very little was known. Mark found and elucidated the structure of a new intermediate in protein synthesis, the peptidyl tRNA complex, and participated in the discovery of stop codons. So Mark, thank you very much for coming along to talk You're to welcome. us. Can I begin by asking you about how you came to apply to Sydney for a PhD? Oh, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, uh, as you said, I, was a, 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 I got my degree in chemistry, mm -hmm. and then I was looking to do a PhD somewhere, and it was assumed that I'd do it in chemistry, and I signed up for that. Uh -huh. And then um, I was unhappy with the chemistry department. I thought that chemistry was dying as a subject. I was mainly interested in biochemistry, but I didn't like the biochemistry department because I thought they didn't understand chemistry properly. <laughs> and so I was casting around and I didn't know what to do. I signed up for chemistry. But then um, I went to a sherry party, which was uh, hosted by David Schoenberg, who was a supervisor of mine. And his wife, uh, who liked to dabble in muscle research, um, in conversation with her, I explained my problem, and she said, well, why don't you go and talk, go to Perutz's group uh, in the Cavendish? And I'd never heard of Perutz's group. I'd never heard of any of the people there. Hmm. Um, it was unknown to most of the people, all the people I met. Uh, but I did toddle along to, the, uh, uh, to Max Perutz's group, which was then uh, located in a, a building called The Hut. Yes. Um, and I knocked on the door, and someone came to the door, and I, th I believe it was David Blow, but I'm not certain of that. And he said, uh, can I, could he help me? And I said, yes, I was a prospective student. I was doing chemistry, and I was looking for somewhere to do a PhD. And he said, um, oh, we're looking for someone just like you. Uh, and I then said to him, well, what sort of things do you do? And he said, well, we solve the structure of proteins. And I knew what a protein was, but... Uh, um, and I said to him, but uh, how do you do that? And he said, we do it but with my X-ray crystallography. And for that, in order to do that, we have to make metal, heavy metal atom derivatives. Uh, and that's... And I said, well, and how do you do that? And they were looking for someone to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said, and how do you do that? And he said, well, you set up crystallization vials, and then you tip in various heavy metal atom compounds, mercury, whatever, in, into that. Mm. And then you make your crystals and then look and see whether you've got a derivative, a useful derivative. And I didn't know anything about it, but it sounded to me, my reaction was that that was a pure alchemy. I couldn't believe that people were doing that sort of thing just so randomly. Mm. It was th thoughtless in a way. And I, I, so I had a very negative attitude, uh, impression. And so I said to him, is that all you do here? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, you, 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 you better come along and meet Francis Crick. Now, I had heard of Crick. I mean, Todd had given us lectures on uh, nucleic acids. Mm -hmm. And he'd got the Nobel Prize for nucleic acids, the internucleotide bond. And I think in those lectures, he probably did mention Francis Crick somewhere, Watson Crick. But I'm not sure he did. Mm -hmm. He thought, he always presented himself as having solved the structure of DNA. Um, anyway, so 
I was taken along to the uh, to see Francis Crick, which was a sort of 20, 30 yard walk outside to a place called the gallery. And there's a, the gallery is a little shut off piece of corridor which uh, the zoology department had loaned the unit, the MRC unit, by the way. It was not the laboratory of molecular biology, it was the unit for the molecular, the studies of molecular structure or something. Mm, yes. It was, uh, it, 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 the LMB came uh, in 1962. Um, later. So we're talking about 61. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the spring at 61. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, I've gone for, forgot. You were saying that you were taken along to the gallery. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the I, it, it, the, this character took me along to the gallery and said, uh, Francis, there's somebody to see you. And Francis Crick was sitting there at the bench doing something with lots of Petri dishes. No idea what he was doing, but he was working with those. He didn't look round. And I think he said, well, I'm busy. Tell him to go away. <laughs> and uh, I just went in there and stood there waiting. And Francis essentially said, uh, um, what is it you want? Without turning around. And I said, um, well, I was a student doing part two chemistry and I looking for a place to do a PhD, and I wondered where they took students and what, whatever. And uh, he said, uh, after a while, he said, look, um, tell me about yourself. So I stood there and told him my name and my college and what I was doing and whatever, and then he said, uh, look, I'm sorry, I can't pay attention. He, that stage, he turned around and said, look, find a piece of paper, write your name on it, uh, somebody I can ask about you. And... Uh, and so I did that, and he said, I said, goodbye, I just left. And I got a very nice letter from him uh, a few days later, which is in the Churchill archives, apologizing for, the, he said that he very rarely got to work in the lab. Mm. I realized late, later on that he's actually working on the genetic, genetics of acridine mutants, uh -huh. yeah. which came to the triplet code, and he was engrossed in that. Um, and uh, asked me to come back and have a chat with him and with Sydney, And so uh, I went along and uh, we had a chat. Francis had asked me to f think of a project that I could do. And I thought of a harebrained project which uh, established the structure of DNA, or helped to establish the structure of DNA, which was chemically, I think, nonsense. Mm. But he didn't know that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, so we, we, I had a chat with him and with Sydney. Sydney at that stage had just discovered messenger RNA, mm, yes. uh, um, and so uh, they said, that, uh, Francis said that uh, they'd take me, and that was, that was uh, more or less that, I think. Mm. So, so you hadn't done any biology or anything like that before then? I did, uh, I did bi biology at school with earthworms oh, right. and things like that. <laughs> so right? a bit different. <clears throat> and I did, had done some biochemistry, mm. half-subject oh. biochemistry for part one. Mm. The tripos. So, what was it that that so interested you about what they were doing? Then it seems a, a long it way. From... I was escaping. Uh -huh. I was escaping from um, uh, from chemistry, yeah. and also from biochemistry. And the thing that impressed me more than anything else was the fact that an old man like Francis, he was only about forty or something, <laughs> but an old man like Francis was actually sitting at the bench doing something, and too interested to talk to somebody about. Elton, he, he was really engrossed in what he was doing. Mm. And I thought that was a real scientist. Whereas my lesson from uh, chemistry was that as soon as people got onto the staff, became a, not a, uh, what are they, uh, demonstrators, yeah. Yeah. demonstrators, junior lecturers, they'd be sitting in glass offices playing with papers mm. and, and pencils and stuff. I thought it was, and he was a real person, a real scientist. That's what, that really impressed me. Mm. And what did you make of Sydney then? Well, Sydney, Sydney was short and fat and stubby. Francis was very elegant. Mm. Sydney had huge eyebrows. I just remember him as a round face, rather tubby, and he, he wasn't interested in me, mm. particularly, I, th I don't think. Mm. Um, I just looked at him and he looked at me. I didn't know anything about Messenger, except I'd been told to read his paper. Uh -huh. It was very complicated. Um, the, on the, the discovery of uh, Messenger with Jacob, Jacob and uh, Messelson, mm -hmm. um, but I, I did, he didn't form much of an opinion in my mind, except he was mm. 
boring and big eyebrows or something. <laughs> but he nominally became your supervisor, even well, though Francis... Well, yes, when I joined the unit, then in the end of September of 1961, mm. uh, Francis explained to me that he liked to mix up mm -hmm. biologists and people with a biological background and a chemical background, mm. and that I had a chemical background, so I was going to be... Sydney would be my supervisor, and then another student, Hans Boyer, who's coming from Denmark, he would be... He had a biochemical background, and Francis would be his supervisor. Mm. So that was the logic that I was given. And uh, in the event, it worked out, out just fine. Francis did tell me it didn't make any difference yeah. who the supervisor was. Mm. And it, for me, it worked out very well. I got huge amounts of supervision from, initially from mm. Francis. Mm. And I think in my... Fi I've tried to work out in my f three years as a, a Sydney student, our total total conversation, which include hellos and things like that, probably amounted to no more than five minutes. <laughs> I mean, he basically, basically ignored me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was fine. So as you just said, when you started your PhD, the LMB didn't even exist, and they were in a, a rather horrible little hut downtown. Um, can you tell me a bit about the hut? Well, the hut was uh, this uh, building, which I think is now a bicycle shed, or it was the last time I saw it, mm. outside the Austin Wing. Um, so this is the back of the Cavendish lab? So it's in, the, in the sort of middle courtyard of, uh, within the Cavendish, mm. yes. And they've been kicked out of the main building by Neville Mott, is that right? No, 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 no. They, 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 they never, there's never the... I don't know how it uh, arose. Mm. They, they, they were in the hut. I think the hut was a pre-existing entity mm. the storage thing storing things or something i don't know mm. and that was the only space that there was there uh -huh. and uh, i don't think they kicked out of the uh, out of the cabinet as such i mean they they had look they had the hut which was this little building mm. which had a lab in it an office for francis and sydney an office for max and i guess don kendrew uh -huh. a toilet maybe one or two other little rooms. There wasn't very much space in there. Mm. Um, so there was that building, uh, and then there was another place called the Greenhouse, which is a lean-to place, as uh, is a, is a room with a lean-to outside, which is a greenhouse sort of thing, in which all the washing up for the unit was done. <laughs> um, and that was where Sidney and his people worked. The, most of the, the, most of the uh, people in structural, what became structural types, the structural people, Al, Alan Edmondson, mm -hmm. and people like that are working on the, so doing wet biochemistry right. on the, uh, as needed for this, making hemoglobin crystals or myoglobin crystals or things associated with that. They were in the hut, in right. the lab and hut. And then there was um, the gallery, I already mentioned, where Francis was working, which was across the way from the hut. Uh, another place, and then there was a, a little shed, which was, I didn't have a name, I think, in which there's an electrophoresis tank. It was a falling down garden <laughs> shed, with the, with the high voltage apparatus in it, and they also had space, I believe, that I never saw it in the Austin wing, mm -hmm. and I, where they built models, perhaps, or they may even have built it in another place. I'm not certain. But it sounds very dilapidated. Well, it, it wasn't dilapidated. It was, it, it, it was, it, it was, it wasn't fancy, mm. right? It was, all, but it, it was, it was, everything was geared to solving problems. Uh -huh. uh, the equipment, the, we were very well equipped, had lots, of, lots of equipment, mm. but no space, uh -huh. and it was crowded with people. Yeah, yeah. So that in the hut, the, uh, sorry, in the in the greenhouse which was a, a, t it was a six by six or something. There were four of us in there, um, crowded in. Um, a, Sydney would sometimes work in there. That's where he, he, he worked when he was doing things. Mm. Um, and there's uh, myself, uh, Hans Boyer, and then an American postdoc, Alex Sedlowski. Uh -huh. the th uh, us. And sometimes Anne and Sarah by as well. Another a research student was actually Sydney's first research student. Hmm. I was his second. So five of you crammed into something. Well, but we went there all the time, yeah, yeah, right? And it was uh, sort of towards the end of finishing up, mm. I suppose. Um, no, he, he, he was still doing quite a bit of work there, actually. 
But Sydney was not, not in there a great deal. But then we also had to have high centrifuges, high speed centrifuges, refrigerators, and all that had to pack into that. It was very tight. Mm. It must have been quite difficult unless you were prepared to be very um, self motivated and not mind too much that. Yeah, I think you're thrown into the, thrown in at the deep end, and if you swam, you swam, and if you didn't, you didn't. Yeah. So a lot was expected of you as a, a new student. Well, but I got a lot of help from Francis. Mm. I mean, he would be by daily to begin with to see what I was doing, what I was playing. To. And I, su- I should say that he had arranged a collaboration between me and Marianne grunberg Monago, who has discovered the enzyme point of five phosphorylase, for which at I got the Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, was, uh, she made, the arrangement of the collaboration was that she would make various synthetic uh, copolynucleotides uh, and then send them to me, RNA molecules, uh, using the polynucleotide five phosphorylase. And then uh, I would test them and see what they coded for, uh, what, which amino acids they coded mm-hmm. for. And um, so initially, at that point, uh, Nuremberg and Maté, actually I should say Maté and Nuremberg, I discovered uh, that poly U makes codes for polyphenol. So that was the first letter that was of the, the first Greek one, and that had been discovered in the summer of '61. Mm-hmm. Was that was that? I was just so that the chronology isn't that that happened, and they thought, oh, we need a chemist, and then you came along, and they oh no, useful oh chemist. no, oh no. I mean, uh, my chemical knowledge was uh, was worthless in this con- context. <laughs> I think yeah. it was. A, a, it was a, I was just an able-bodied. Uh, person yeah. who knew who could handle mm. scientific matters. Sure. Um, sure. So, the, the, what what was your project to begin with then? I, I didn't have a formal project. Yeah. It was just to test poly, the polynucleotides which Marianne was making, mm-hmm. uh, see what they coded for, yeah. and see see where that led. So, was there a, a feeling? around the lab that people were doing things that were really important? In 1962. When you arrived? 60 years, in 61. Mm. Well, look, they discovered destructive DNA. Yeah. They're on the way to solving the structure of proteins. It was incredible what they'd achieved. Mm. Fred Sanger was just down the road solve the structure of uh, the sequence of proteins. Mm. So yes, they did think that they were doing really important things and they were regarded as very arrogant. Yeah. And there weren't very many people in the world who recognised that they had done important things and were doing important things mm. so and regarded them as arrogant. The biochemistry people, uh, people in biochemistry regarded them as very arrogant people. Mm. So why was it that, that people didn't realise how important it was? Well, they thought that the term molecular biology was just a fancy name for biochemistry. Wow. They didn't see the difference between mm. biochemistry and molecular biology. Mm-hmm. The thing that distinguished molecular biology was that it was concerned with how information is uh, carried along from generation to generation, mm. what, nature, what is the nature of that information, and how is it expressed? Yeah. Yeah. What, what is this information? Yeah. That's an incredible question. It, essentially, it came out of the sequence of DNA, or the, the, the structure of DNA. Mm. It must be in the sequence of the nucleotide and nucleic acids. And that somehow had to be get into the proteins to be, mm. to, mm. because that's the, the workhorse of biology is done by proteins. So it had to be, that was the solution. And they, were, they recognized the problem. So when you started your PhD, yes. They knew about messenger RNA, and they knew the first codon in the triplet code was... No, they didn't know it was a triplet code. No, so they knew that poly right. U... They knew that poly U coded for, for polyphenol right. okay. Uh, so, and so it was presumed that uh, you could read four nucleotides or six nucleotides mm-hmm. or something at a time, but it, it had to be more than two. Yeah. Yeah, so all, the, all that was knew. known was that it had to be more than two because with a doublet code, you'd only be able to code for 16 amino acids and there are actually Correct. 20, so, yeah. But then if you've got a triplet code, you've got 64 and you've got a problem. Yeah, right. Hmm. Yes. So that was what Francis was most interested so in. So Francis, right? was, well, he was interested in the code in general. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so the uh, first, so he was working on the acridine mutants. Yes. And in those... 
I, I don't think in explaining the accuracy of mutants mm -hmm. it would take too long. Yes. But yeah. basically, as a result of his studies on that, he came along one morning mm -hmm. and explained to me that it's three, three pluses work, it give you wild type. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> but he said, don't worry, it's a triple code. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think, oh, well, that's good, that's a triple code. Um, but I should add that there's a whole lot of other information about mm. the code which was known at that time uh -huh. and which Kranz has explained to me, all right? I hadn't actually realised well, before. But people but don't. There's no, actually no. all this other information and it built a solid structure yeah. that you could yeah. see the genetic code taking you shape. You just needed that first code on. And well, you, you needed that, and, but as you, got, so that as you got information, mm. when I put a poly UC into an in vitro system and found it coded for phenyl and serin, proline and uh, 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 leucine, mm. it was not surprising. Yeah. It made yeah. sense. Yeah. And the next one I did was poly, uh, poly UA, and uh, poly UA coded for phenylalanine mainly, and then some, it's mainly U's and some A's. Mm. Uh, and then it, could, it could inclu included uh, uh, isoleucine and um, leucine and uh, maybe a bit of lysine, I can't remember. Mm. Um, and but what was so striking there was that I'd found that uh, poly UC and poly UA both incorporate leucine. Huh. Right? And I therefore thought I'd established that the genetic code was degenerate. degenerate. You have two different codons, UUA, say, and UUC, mm. for leucine. Yeah. And I've, I've made a real discovery. Yeah. And then Alex Shedlowski, this American postdoc, she said to me, but did you do the control? <laughs> and I said, what's the control? And she said, well, poly you. So I said, well, it codes for phenylalanine. She said, do you know that? Mm. I said, no, but I can do it. So I went back and did it. And it also incorporated a whole lot of leucine. Oh, annoying. <laughs> so <laughs> my discovery was undone in short term. And uh, so we then started worrying about what, what was going on. Mm. And if you looked at uh, Nuremberg's and a church paper subsequently, it turned out that they also had this leucine being incorporated by all these polymers um, and so that was the that that was the first discovery I made in the code and then I discovered do you want all this I don't know whether you want this. I, I definitely want all this <laughs> so the the second thing I found was that um, Marianne had made some polymers some poly CA polymers now it had been originally reported by Nuremberg that poly C coded for polyproline mm -hmm. but nobody could repeat it didn't seem to do anything um, so I, uh, she, she made this poly CA for me, which I tested, and uh, that uh, coded for proline, some serine, sorry, that's wrong, it coded for proline, some threonine, and some histidine. Mm. And uh, that seemed like that was some new, new, new angle on different codons. Up to that stage, all the publications had uh, from a church group and Nuremberg's group, they're both the main, the main people doing this, uh, these decoding studies, uh, had contained you. Mm. And indeed, uh, Nuremberg had opined that in order to make a codon, it had to have a uracil in it. Mm. Um, which Francis, of course, said was complete nonsense because uh, it c couldn't be that way. There wasn't enough uracil in the DNA. Yeah. Or was it D T in the DNA? Mm. Um, Nevertheless, it was the first code, uh, first uh, uh, messenger or synthetic messenger which uh, didn't contain uracil, hmm. and it was at that time quite important. It's, uh, no importance anymore, but at the time it was quite important, hmm. and that was occurred in the summer, uh, the early summer of 1962. Hang on, so you'd only been a PhD student for. What, six months at that point? Yes, yeah, five months, five or six months. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's well, not bad. You know, it was astonishing. <laughs> not bad for a student. Year. It was astonishing to be <laughs> working on a problem like that yeah. and actually competing with other big labs. Yeah. Because the other big labs, there's myself and Marianne doing it. Mm. And uh, the other big labs, they had, I don't know, more, many more people yeah. than that. So, so was it a competition or a collaboration? 
uh, with with Nuremberg and it's show. Oh, there's competition between them. Right. In fact, and, they're and all they're all. If you go back and look at the literature, mm -hmm. all published in PNAS. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll see they're all rushing out the date. They they raw date as fast as they could uh -huh. to establish their uh, priority on yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. various things. So was that intimidating for you that you were competing like this? No, I just I just uh, I was just doing what I could do. Yeah. yeah. With the. And I, I then got sidelined uh, away from the code. Um, well, let's just finish off about code, though. So yes. I think you said somewhere that that was exhilarating. It sounds like it oh, can't it was, have been anything else, actually. It was, it, of course it was exhilarating. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just the stage at which the press was getting interested in the genetic code. Mm -hmm. Up until then, DNA, nobody knew anything about DNA. Mm. And suddenly, the genetic code was the secret of life. And the press was starting to talk about the secret of life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was really exhilarating and a wonderful time. Yeah, no, it sounds it. But it sounds like also that you must have had very green fingers to get all this stuff to work. I worked very hard. Mm. I wouldn't say green fingers. I, I was just fairly diligent, yeah. I think. I worked very hard. Yeah, so you realised fairly early on that this was what you wanted to be doing in life. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I stepped into it in... in uh, I was lucky to drop into it. Mm. Largely the result of this Katzenberg suggestion. Yeah. Um, and then it was, it was better than anything I might have uh, mm. imagined. Mm. Mm. It was yeah. wonderful. Now, I realised at the time it was wonderful. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> so your first publication was a letter to nature with Marianne Grunberg Managa. Correct. That? And that, that contained the two main points. Mm. One was the uh, poly U coding for, phenyl, uh, for leucine as mm -hmm. well as phenylalanine. Yeah. And there's a problem there. And the second one was the uh, codons didn't need to contain uracil. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And it was also famous for something else, I believe. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, when I, uh, when I wrote up the paper, you're quite right. Uh, when I wrote, uh, wrote up the results that I'd been doing, um, I, uh, I c we all called them trinucleotide coding units or something like that. Mm. And uh, when I, got, I gave it to Francis to read, and when it came back, he said, that's fine, but uh, we've, got, we've, got a, a, we've, got a, we've got a word for that. And it's codon. Huh. And he, so he had been through and crossed out the trinucleotide coding units and put codon in its place. I'd never heard of the word before. Hmm. Um, so he just made that up? Well, there's a, there's a, Sydney claims that he thought of it. Hmm. I never heard that until many, many, many years later. Hmm. I assumed that Francis had thought it up, but I don't know. Well, I guess they, they must have been working very closely together anyway. So it... They're working closely together and... Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I've always assumed that, uh, and I've always, get, when I'm asked, I always say this Francis thought of it, mm -hmm. but I don't absolutely know. Yeah. So this famous partnership between Crick and Brenner, yes. what, what was that like to look at? Was it? Well, they, they shared an office. They spent a lot of time talking together, mm. discussing matters together. They discussed what they should do with the division together. Mm -hmm. I think there was, although Francis always had the upper hand, he always decide, made the final decision. I think when it came to scientific things, what was remarkable was the manner in which they both looked at any problem in the same way. Mm. And if there was any difference, they'd be arguing about it and straightening out the thinking. And actually, I think it's a wonderful thing for the two of them to have, to share with each other. Mm. And I might add that later on, when it came to pro, uh, membranes and uh, studies of membranes and chromatin, which uh, when ro many years later Roger Kornberg mm -hmm. was in the uh, it was a postdoc in the lab, mm. and I then found that we could have a similar relationship, mm. discuss problems, whether it's chromatin or of which I didn't know a lot, but or membranes, and he didn't know a lot, but he'd worked in the field. Um, we could have a similar sort of rapport in knowing how the other person would think. Mm. 
<laughs> about the problem. As the only person I've ever found that I could yeah. share that with. So you didn't have that with Francis then? No, Francis, but he, he, I was intimidated by Francis. He was a towering figure. Mm. I mean, physically, he was quite tall. Mm. He's imposing. And I liked him. Yeah. But he's not, he was, he was, uh, he's a hero. Yes. He wasn't yeah. a colleague. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So you ever felt like you were on an equal footing with Francis? There's no way that I was on an equal footing. Mm. What other characters from that time stand out for you, then? Aside from Max Perutz, who was, uh, despite his... Uh, well, Max Perutz, he, he was a, a very good for the lab, mm. all right? I mean, as the chairman. Yeah. And for many reasons, all right? One of which he, he knew his limitations. Mm. Uh, the other person who was uh, extremely important, probably the most important, was Michael Fuller, mm. because he was the la became uh, called a lab steward. He uh, joined the lab, I think, in fifty-seven. The unit in nineteen fifty-seven, I think, is a, a sweeping the floor and tidying up. Mm. And then uh, he'd just been given more and more uh, duties, and eventually he uh, managed the whole of the move from the unit into the LMB, mm -hmm. that move which occurred over a period of about two days, three days, in which we had to pack all our belongings, everything, glassware, everything, into tea chests. Mm -hmm. And then those were, he'd arranged that those would be all moved to the new lab, mm -hmm. and they're brought to the right places in the lab, and we unpacked them and put them all out. And he, in the meantime, had helped to design the labs, uh -huh. and it was a hell of a lot of work, yeah. I'm, and I think, I'm not sure who did all the designing, but certainly he had a major uh, part in it, and Sydney also had an important part in designing kitchens and things like mm. that. Um, and uh, then he, when, he, uh, when he was in the lab, he would uh, he, uh, maintain the stores. Yes. So the lab, one of the best features of the lab was we had a stores where you could just uh, go and get, uh, to a hole in the wall, There'd be a guy there, Michael Fuller. He'd ask, ask, could I have this chemical, uh, that chemical? Could I have uh, deoxy ATP or something? Mm. And he'd go to the shelf, find it, and give it to you. And you signed in a book for legal reasons. And that was that. There was no paper, no other paperwork. <laughs> and Michael Fuller had the property that if you came along and asked for a, a chemical compound and he didn't have it, he'd order two. So you'd have one there and then one for the shelf. <laughs> and in that way, the, uh, the uh, resources of the stores become enormous. They yeah. have almost anything, any chemicals you could imagine you might want because mm -hmm. somebody else had wanted it beforehand. Yeah. It was a superb setup. And he ran all of that. And in the mornings, he had to go and deliver all the mail. <laughs> so he'd saw, see what everybody was getting, mm -hmm. deliver the mail to their pigeonholes. Each person had a little pigeonhole. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, manage the stores, and manage the equipment, mm. and everything. It's remarkable. He, it? no, he's astonishing, because, and it's, so it became, when, when uh, later on, when we had American postdocs going back to the United States, they'd want to know what equipment, they, what, which was the best buy, mm -hmm. if they wanted a centrifuge or spectrophotometer, which was the best buy, mm. what should they get? And he'd have a list. He'd tell them, you're going to need this, you're going to need that, you're going to need the other. Have you thought of this? Right? Maybe you'd need this. Mm -hmm. And the best ones to buy are this and so on. And he'll help them work out their grant applications. So he's of enormous importance, not just within the lab, but also actually to those people mm -hmm. setting up labs in the States. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Astonishing man. Yeah. So this brings us very neatly on to the, um, the hut moving up to Addenbrook site and becoming the LMB in 1962. Yes. And I think you brought something along oh, at see that this time. One. So oh, can yes, you tell right. me a bit about, about what you've brought? Well, well, you probably need to hold it up for the camera. <laughs> that one. Yeah. That one. <laughs> After we'd moved out of the lab, mm -hmm. they had this move. So, yeah in February 1962. Um, about a fortnight or thereabouts after that, Hunter Boy and I decided to go and have a look at the old unit, what was, what was going on there. Mm -hmm. 
and we went along to the hut. The door was open, a lot. The, there were papers lying all over the place. There were boxes of stuff lying around. We had a look around. Um, we thought we'd take a souvenir. <laughs> so there were two of these uh -huh. pieces. So Cavendish Laboratory Medical Research Council Unit for Molecular Biology. So okay. where, where was that then on the front? So there were two of these. Uh -huh. There's one on the front of the hut yeah. and one on the front of the uh, greenhouse. Uh, <laughs> we decided to take them as mementos. We got, he had a, a penknife screwdriver uh -huh. and undid, undid them both. Right? I took the one from the greenhouse, which is this one, yeah. and he took the one from the hut. I don't know what's happened to that one. <laughs> it may have got lost. Um, and on that occasion, when we were rummaging around, we went and looked at uh, all the stuff, which li all the papers and stuff lying around. And there's whole boxes of stuff there, of, uh, and papers lying on the floor and stuff. And I decided I'd take a memento. We we're looking for mementos, basically. Mm. And I found a file uh, lying around called On Protein Synthesis, mm -hmm. which is in Francis's handwriting. So I took that folder. Um, and I found some large cardboard sheets with the base pairs drawn out on them yeah. um, and various other things, various things to do with the DNA. I took, uh, I, uh, and there was, I think, three of those, I can't remember. Um, and I took, the, uh, took those with me and we took them back and I've kept them ever since. <laughs> um, and the file on protein synthesis turned out to be, contain um, Francis's, uh, the first chapter of his thesis, handwritten, with the, uh, the first chapter of his thesis, yeah. uh, written out on hand, um, the first, uh, uh, the only existing uh, draft, a mimeograph draft, of his uh, article on protein synthesis. <laughs> it, it contains some of his goodies. So he just dumped it, or people forgot oh, well, it? I don't know what on earth. The, the doors open, there are people lying all over the place, and we just looked around and helped ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, ha I have a suspicion that if we hadn't taken it, it would have been lost. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that file and uh, all those drawings which are related, some of them are related, uh, to, I think, to the... Uh, in 1953, uh, Watson Crick had an, uh, uh, gave a talk at Cold Spring Harbour on the structure, of, I think it was called Shrink Harbor, on the structure of DNA and base pairing. And I think that these pictures, that some of the pictures came from that uh, presentation, a poster session sort of thing. Mm. Um, mm. I did show them to Jim, and Jim couldn't remember where they came from. Yeah. Oh, right. So all of that stuff, anyway, is in the church a lot of archives yeah, now. Yeah. Huh. So I just want to finish up oh, by yes. um, asking you one last question. Oh, yes. Um, so October 1962, yes. a fair proportion of the staff of the LMB won a Nobel Prize. Um, so, so Max Perutz, John Kendrew, Francis Crick yes. won chemistry and physiology and medicine. Yes. Can you tell me something about the parties? Well, the, the, uh, it was in the beginning, uh, early October 1962, so you should remember that the lab had been open for about eight months, something like that. Uh, it was young, exuberant. And the, we heard that uh, Francis and Jim had been awarded the Gardner Prize. I think it was the first one ever awarded, mm -hmm. which is an international prize, the first major prize they got. And there was great celebration and there was had went to France's house and had a party, a champagne party, to celebrate the Gardner Award. Um, and then the following Thursday, there's, it came through at about lunchtime that Perutz and Kendra had been awarded the Chemistry Prize, Nobel Prize, uh, for the structure of hemoglobin and myoglobin. And uh, so uh, people stopped working. There was going to be a party, there was clearly going to be a party, probably up in the canteen mm -hmm. of the lab. Um, and uh, so Max, Don Kendrew was away, he was in London on that occasion. Um, and uh, so Max 
decided to organize a party for the, in the canteen for about four o'clock, I guess, or half past four. Um, and uh, Max, uh, Max, Max was a teetotaler, so he, so he, just, he knew that everybody liked to drink beer, so he, he got lots and lots of beer in and went up to the canteen at the appropriate time. And uh, I don't drink beer, but uh, people were drinking beer, quite a bit of it, and celebrating. And uh, John Kendrew, when he, he uh, k appeared at the party, he thought that his party should be, being a good college man, should be celebrated with wine. <laughs> and he ordered uh, a whole load of wine, which came pretty quickly. Yeah. And so we switched from, uh, or there's drinking beer, switched uh, to drinking white wine. <laughs> and uh, that went on for a short while, and then Francis arrived, and he said, "It's completely mad. You've got to have champagne." And so he got managed, to, I don't know how, to get a whole lot of chill, chilled champagne. It's uh, quite impressive for those days. <laughs> yes, it was. But there's Michael Fuller behind it. He knew where to get things. So Mike Fuller. It's Michael to Fuller source. organizing all this, <laughs> wow. all right, for Max. Yeah. Um, and so he got the. We we switched to champagne, and there's some nibbles as well. And the net result of that is that um, everyone was very drunk. <laughs> and I, I do recall, but I don't think it's, a, it's, it's fair to say how drunk people did get. Probably not. <laughs> it, 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 probably not. But it, we, I, myself included, we all got really pretty drunk. Yeah. And then the following uh, Thursday, Watson Crick and <laughs> Morris Wilkins got the Nobel Prize for Medicine Physiology. Mm. I mean... And so we, we, we then had a, this third Thursday, we had a Nobel Prize uh, party in uh, Francis's house again, then the Golden Helix. Um, and uh, that was at the stage at which, uh, it, it, uh, so, uh, not long before November the 5th. Mm. So there were fireworks in hand. Mm. And one of the postdocs, Hildegard Lamfram, had uh, been out and bought a whole case of uh, a whole load of uh, fireworks to celebrate, and uh, those were left down in the end. Francis' house was about five levels high. It was a t tenement building, mm -hmm. it was, uh, about uh, I think five levels, four four levels of uh, rooms, and then a, a roof garden, and uh, people were drinking and drinking and drinking. And then somebody, somebody remembered the, all those fireworks at the down at the down at the entrance. So they went and collected them up, and I didn't know about them, but I went up into the roof garden, realizing a lot of people were up there, uh, just as the fireworks were ending. <laughs> and I do remember seeing uh, uh, Hugh Huxley there lighting rockets, <laughs> and he was uh, trying to hit St. John's College Chapel roof with them. <laughs> and he's taking the rocket, and a rocket, and holding it in his hand, lighting the fuse paper and waiting until it was really going and then letting go oh, gosh. and trying to hit the St. John's College Chapel. And the last, I think, biggest rocket, he went over the <laughs> roof of St. John's College Chapel. Uh, and then there was nothing left but all the sort of little bits and pieces, uh, bangers and uh, other little things like that, mm -hmm. these jumping things, whatever you go, bang, 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 whatever crackers. those are, yeah. crackers, um, and quite a lot of bangers. And uh, so there were four of us who put those things in our, we started letting them off, but actually we climbed up onto the roof. So f from the roof garden, there's a, there's a tiled roof mm -hmm. with chimneys along, along it. And there must have been a flattest part in between, not very wide, but flattest part in between. I have no idea, I don't remember. But I do know that four of us climbed up the, the, this tiled roof and held onto the chimneys and started lighting these bangers with one, I don't know how we're doing it, lighting the, we're drunk, lighting these bangers and throwing them into Portugal Place, which is four floors below. It's a, it's a pavement, of people mm. going up and down. We're throwing them out of the, uh, down at the pavement. And these four, I know, I was one of them, right? Uh, Fred Sanger, I think, was another. Gosh. <laughs> There's another one, Les Smith, mm -hmm. who was a, what are all the staff in the French language division, PNAC, eh, sorry, in protein chemistry at that yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think the, the first one, fourth one, I'm not sure, sure who that was. But there's only four of us, and we were climbing up there doing this, uh, and letting the, the, lighting the bangers, 
holding them until they're about to go off and then throwing them into the into the portico place. And uh, it was crazy. Yeah. And once we're standing there doing this, Les Smith's fire, uh, pocket started oh, gosh. blowing out. It caught, it caught fire. And uh, so he was standing there pulling this, pulling all these fireworks out of his pocket, which is stuffed in there. Um, and we realized how stupid it was, and we came down from there. He burned his arm quite badly. Mm. And so Fred Sanger had to take him to hospital. Um, and then we went downstairs, and uh, I went downstairs, and then I went, I don't know, I, I went downstairs, and then the bell went, the front door bell. And uh, I was down there and uh, watched what was going on. Somebody opened the door, and, and the policeman was there. <laughs> and the policeman was apparently, uh, been, uh, there'd been a complaint lodged by the next door neighbor lady who had some whippets. And the fireworks bangers were disturbing her whippets, oh. and she wanted it stopped. Mm. So the policeman was there. Anyway, uh, someone, Francis came down in response to the bell, and uh, disarmingly chatted with the policeman, told him they're having a very special party. He'd be able to read it in, about in the newspapers the next day. Mm. They're having champagne. Would he like a glass? <laughs> and. Uh, the policeman said yes, he took off his helmet, he was given a glass, he drank a glass of champagne, and then uh, after 10 minutes or whatever, he left and that was the end of it. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a wonderful occasion. I bet, yes. Mark Bretcher, thank you so much for sharing your memories with us. <laughs> thank you. It's fun.